This is July the 12th, 2015. Our lesson is number six. This is unit two. And our topic is no tolerance for corrupt officials. Our devotional reading is Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 15 through 20. Our background scripture is Micah, the third chapter, and our printed passage is Micah, the third chapter, verses 5 through 12. Our key verse is Micah, the third chapter, and the eighth verse. If you are reading from the Faith Pathway Adult Study Manual, the topic for the lesson for you would read, Public Trust Betrayed. Our lesson's aims for this particular lesson is list descriptions of the false prophets and of Micah's prophetic office. Explain how greed can influence someone to use position of power to exploit people. And our last aim of our lesson is to perform a service. It is plan a worship service in which leaders in the church and our community are honored and in which prayers are offered on their behalf. Our lesson focuses basically from verses five to verse 12 out of the third chapter of Micah. And as we begin at the very first verse, the fifth verse, which states, thus said the Lord concerning the prophets that make people err, they bite with their teeth and cry peace. And he that puts not into their mouths, they even prepare war against him. As we look at what Micah being ushered by the Spirit of God is saying to the people, to the leaders, to the officials, to the authorities uh, in the nation of Israel, uh, to those who have been charged with the responsibility of speaking the truth to the people, so therefore they will not be misled. But that is not the nature of what Micah has been charged to bring before the people. What he alerts to us is, is that the people have begun to give song bites. I correct that, not the people, but the prophets, the priest, the authorities, the officials have begin to give sound bites to those who will afford them or grant unto them or return or give unto them gifts, money, things of value. And as long as they are receiving the money, the things of value, as long as it is increasing their status, as long as they are benefiting from what they are collecting, although they have been charged with the responsibility of proclaiming the truth to the people, so therefore the people would not be easily led into traps and then find themselves consumed with the destruction of mankind and wonder why didn't our leaders tell us different? Because the leaders have become consumed with receiving. And as long as it was increasing their statue, 
as long as it was increasing their lifestyle, they became attached to saying what was fattening their wallets, their accounts, and their lifestyle. And that is a danger that falls upon humanity. It is a, it is a character that brings those in position of power, it brings them to a low place, although they have been raised to a high place so that they would then be able to have insight and vision and then give unto the people that they serve the correct information, lead them in the correct paths, in the right direction. But because of these tangible things, because of wealth, because of money, and when we speak of money, let us be clear that we are not speaking against wealth. We are not speaking against the acquisition of money. We understand through the book of Ecclesiastes that the scripture says, money answereth all things. But we also know that the scripture says, it is the love of money, which is the root of all evil. So it is not money itself that is corrupt or is evil, but it is the desire of it. It is the love of it that once it begins to increase, once it begins to multiply, I then become attached <coughs> to its increase. And because I don't want to see the decrease of it, I continue to do what has caused it to multiply. I want to connect verse 11 along with verse 5 so that uh, we can combine the behavior, we can combine the actual practices of the prophets also along with verse 11 which says the heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof teach for hire and the prophets thereof divine for money yet will they lean upon the Lord and say is not the Lord among us no evil can come upon us. To verse 11 and to verse 5, I would like to read the word out of Jeremiah, the sixth chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. And I want to couple both of these together because uh, it is speaking about the prophets, about the priest, about the head judges, uh, about the uh, leaders, the teachers. Here's what Jeremiah says in the sixth chapter and the 13th verse. Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is giving to covetedness. From the prophet, even to the priest, Everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not ashamed. No, they did not even blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall at the time I punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. 
Now, I know many times when scriptures such as this is read, it comes across as an opportunity for those who choose to beat up upon the uh, present uh, rulers and those in position of authority. Um, many times people see this as just a exchange uh, from people who are somewhat disenfranchised or disconnected or locked out of the rewards of the system. And so they depict this as they're whiners, they're agitators, uh, they're just uh, upset that they haven't uh, done like I have and pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and they haven't uh, taken advantage of the unlimited uh, possibilities and opportunities that reside. And so what else do you expect for them to do? Uh, of course, they're going to complain. Of course, they have to blame somebody. They have to say it's someone else's fault and not their own. Uh, so I don't want us to look at this along the lines of the blame game. Uh, those that are true believers understand that we all have been endowed with the blessings of God that we could utilize the gifts that he has given us so that we could provide for ourselves. For Christ did say that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Now we also understand that he was not just speaking about physical life. He was not just speaking about the material acquisition of things, but also speaking to eternal life, the life that lasts beyond this physical domain. So I didn't want us to look at this as though, well, here's another opportunity where they get to beat up on people that uh, they have no idea what it costs and what it takes to uh, actually manage in this uh, arena and these positions. But here is a focus that we need to look at. And this here is coming right out of the sixth verse, which says, therefore, night shall be upon you that you shall not have a vision and it shall be dark unto you that you shall not have divine and the sun shall go down over the prophets and the day shall be dark over them. In this verse, Micah describes the consequences that will take place as a result of leaders seeking their own worth, trying to accumulate for themselves. Now, the diviners were those who actually were like fortune tellers. They would uh, supposedly look into the future and be able to predict and to determine uh, which path were we treading, what was going to be the outcome. And so as people began to put their trust in these officials, to put their trust in leaders, then the leaders began to misguide them and to mislead them, forsaking the responsibility and the charge that was placed upon them. And so as this occurs, everyone is not going to indulge into doing research and investigations and doing surveys and studies and looking at the data and the outcome and trying to connect the dots. So therefore, unfortunately, we have a large portion of our people in any civilization as it was in the time of Israel 
with the northern and the southern kingdom, just as uh, it was then, so as it is now. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are misled and seek to put their trust in people who are elected to represent their best interests. Here is the problem that occurs when that is solely rendered over to people in those positions. When it is obvious that they have lost their direction, they not only enter into the darkness, but they also bring those whom they have been charged to lead. Here is what the scripture says in Isaiah. And, in, and this is in the 29th chapter and the ninth verse. 29th of Isaiah and the ninth verse. And it says, pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. The Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the shears. The shears responsibility, which was also mentioned in the uh, seventh verse, where it says, then shall the shears be ashamed and the diviners confounded. Yes, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. No answer of God from their lips. But the people who look to them uh, for response, who look to them for uh, a answer uh, to the times and to the issues that are before them, they look to them, and yet what Isaiah says is that they've been blinded. Isaiah tells us is that their actions appear as though they are drunk, but they haven't been drinking any wine. It says that they stagger, but it's not from intoxicating drink, but that the Lord has placed them into a deep sleep. Therefore, those who are led by the Lord should not look towards these people who cannot answer, who don't understand that we cannot continue along these paths that we have been traveling that keeps us in a vicious cycle where each generation is repeating the acts of the generations before. Um, I believe that some of the neural scientists and physicians uh, through study have said that uh, we leave here, speaking of people, we leave here with two-thirds or three-fourths of our brain which has never been used. That we are in a cycle that continues to activate and to energize the same brain cells because of repetition. And it does not allow us, because we have been stooped by what is constantly uh, brought about through media and brought about through our TV viewing, through our literature that we read, talk shows, so forth and so on, that because we continue to engage into the same dialogue, that we don't move to a higher level of consciousness. Now, this does not speak for the totality of the masses of people. Certainly, this was not the case for Micah, who actually was charged by the Spirit of God, which we will talk about in just a bit. But this represents a large enough amount of people that we can address it. 
But certainly this not, does not say that humanity as a whole is stooped into a vicious cycle because that would negate the fact that God is still God, that God, yes, is still in control, that God is still our creator, that God still imparts his spirit to those who call out to him. So we cannot say that all of humanity is fallen because that would negate the power of God's spirit, his Holy Spirit. And also that would negate the purpose for which he sent his son, Christ Jesus, into the world to die so that we might have a right to eternal life. But what it does say is, is that. There is a segment among us who chooses to disregard the light of God. And scripture even answers to that as well. For the scripture tells us that Christ is the light of the world and the light came into the world but the world didn't comprehend it, that mankind did not comprehend the light. And so many times the destruction that we see, the downfall of one civilization or one generation or one group of people or one nation to another, what scripture tells us is how does that happen when it is God's purpose that none should perish? Well, here is the love of God. This is out of John, the third chapter. And it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. He didn't send Christ Jesus into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he does not believe in the truth, in the teachings of Christ. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. This brings us right to verse eight, because as we talk about leadership that has fallen, just as much fervor and just as much attention should also be paid to those who are empowered by God. Just as we recognize leaders who are fallen, we need to recognize those whose lives are held in danger because they speak the truth. How many times have we read in the gospel that Christ on many occasions, that the chief priest and the Pharisees and the Sadducees sought to kill him, but because of the crowd, because of the people within his company, who recognize that this man speaketh the truth. They feared the people, therefore they did not seek 
or did it not follow their wish to to kill the one who was charged by the spirit of God to minister to the people? But look at what Micah says here. He says, but truly, I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. That's a strong statement that Micah makes there. But the statement or the clincher out of the statement that he uses is that he he makes those that are listening to him recognize that I'm not just speaking uh, from the power of myself. I'm not just uh, speaking because of those who uh, politically or economically or socially are backing me. I don't have the support of uh, this institution or that institution. I don't have the support of the priest. I don't have the support of the teachers of the schools of theology. I, I don't have the support of the uh, rulers. Um, I don't have the uh, committeemen uh, and my support. Uh, I'm standing alone, yet I am strong. And what gives an individual the courage to do this when one has already seen what has happened to others who dare to speak against the status quo? Nothing but the spirit of God could compel and convict an individual to take such a leap. But let's see then what he says when he means that he is, he has the power of the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob and Israel their transgressions and their sins. And he cites those in verses 9 and 10. He says, hear this, I pray you, you heads of the house of Jacob and prince of the house of Israel that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Now, as we come closer to the close of our lesson, I wanted to uh, read this here. And this is out of Jeremiah. This is the 22nd verse. Uh, I'm sorry, the 22nd chapter, uh, beginning here at the 13th. And it reads, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice, who uses his neighbor's service without wages and gives him nothing for his work, who says, I will build myself a wide house with spacious chambers and cut out windows for it, paneling it with cedar. Does this seem like it parallels uh, some of the announcements that uh, we have over our airways today, where we are constantly reminded of how much additional money that the wealthy are making on top of what they've already made. It is almost as though there's a contest going on. And while those that work 
in these establishments. Their pay is reduced. Their departments are closed. Their labor we can't afford. Their benefits are too much. Uh, we can't maintain uh, our wealth if we have to answer to the needs of those who are actually establishing our wealth. But because we don't have the heart to share, because it has become a competition, it appears, among the rich, the wealthy, and again, this is not a paintbrush across all that are wealthy. This is not a paintbrush across all that are rich. But as I stated before, this is an acknowledgement of enough that are in these practices that it can be addressed and it can be entertained. We know that there are many who do who have all types of programs out here to enable those that are disabled, that are disenfranchised, that are not connected. And we thank God for them and their heart of love. But still, the level of poverty is rising at an alarming rate. So therefore, just as Micah was saying unto Jacob and unto Israel, to the north and to the south of the nation of that day, as he was warning them, saying that, uh, woe unto those who build with unrighteousness and injustices, and then take the wages of their neighbor's service and then exploit them economically. So as we look at these parallels here, although we're speaking of a time that has passed, it would also, uh, I would also be mindful to acknowledge that uh, Jehoiakim was the ruler in Ju Judah for about a hundred years after Micah had been charged by the Spirit of God to speak the things that he said to give warning to the nation. After this, a hundred years later, around 586 BC, this was when Zion and Jerusalem became leveled, as it teaches us in verse 12, that Zion would be plowed as a field and Jerusalem would become heaps and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. There it talks about how Zion was actually the joy of the entire earth, that it was the city of the great king. King David, and it talks about how people honored it, how people worshipped it, how people admired it, even how people revered it, but yet it fell. And a lot of times we say that these acts take place because it is the wrath of God, the punishment of God, but actually Although God is well aware of the tendencies that nations have that bring them to their doom, it is the same God who sends the messenger to the nation to warn the nation, to tell the nation that if you continue along this path, just ha as others have fallen, you too will fall. It's the same God who compels and convicts a messenger by his spirit to go against the status quo, even recognizing what that entails, what the cost of that is. That same God 
sends that messenger to that nation to warn them that you cannot defy the principles upon which I have created my creation. When you begin to defy the principles that hold my creation in order, there are consequences. And I close with this reading here. And this is out of 1 Peter 3.15. I would not uh, want to leave those that are believers, those who know the God that we speak of, I would not want to leave us not understanding where are we in this whole order of things here. This is talking back in the past, but how does that relate to us today? Here is what the word of God says out of first Peter, the third chapter and the 13th verse. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Fear should be with reverence for the God who has uh, enabled you to speak of hope in a time of tyranny. But having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. I hope that we have shared uh, whatever insights and whatever understandings and comprehension that God would have imparted through his word. And it is always our prayer that the blessings of God would be upon you and may he keep you in his perfect peace. God bless you.